Hi, I'd like to go ahead and call our meeting to order. Today is Monday, June 24th, and this is a meeting of the Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Education. This is a work session. Thank you all for coming. We always appreciate your presence and your input during our meeting, so thank you. Um, first, I'd ask for the approval of the agenda. Can someone please read that, Ann? Yeah, I move that the agenda of Monday, June 24, 2013, Board of Education meeting be approved as set forth and that each item is considered ready for discussion and or action. Is there a second, please? Second. This is a roll call action. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Ann Halt. Aye. Director Rosenthal. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Uh, next is Superintendent's Report. Dr. Benson. Yes, good evening. Uh, tonight I'm pleased to congratulate uh, Rhoda Shepard, Lay Rhoda, <laughs> Director of Student Services on being named to the National Academy of School Nursing, the membership organization her profession contributes to, the advancement of school nursing. Rhoda will be inducted into this prestigious organization as part of the organization's annual conference this weekend. Congratulations, Rhoda. It's my, uh, uh, was my privilege to participate in the dedication of the uh, Larry Niemeyer Field at the Jefferson high school softball complex on June 12th. Uh, this is a uh, special uh, recognition and plaque that was given to Coach Niemeyer for his extraordinary coaching career in the district. Uh, he led uh, softball teams to 2,089 victories, the most ever by any high school coach anywhere. So uh, congratulations uh, to Larry and uh, uh, if you go by there, there's a very nice uh, plaque uh, out on the uh, outfield uh, recognizing it as Larry Niemeyer Field. Uh, we remind the public that there will be only one board meeting uh, in July. The meeting will be held Monday, July 15th at 5 p.m. here at the ELSC. Lastly, I want to extend uh, my uh, congratulations to Dr. Gary O'Malley, Deputy Superintendent, on his being named to the Mount Vernon Community School District as their new superintendent. Uh, congratulations, Gary. Uh, you will be missed. Uh, it's been a, a, a really great four years, and we appreciate your service to Cedar Rapids and wish you all the best in Mount Vernon. And on behalf of the board, I will echo those comments. We will miss you, Gary. Um, next, uh, I ask for any school board member reports or comments. Okay. I just want to once again remind everyone that we do have three school board positions up for election this fall. Um, I'm also pleased to announce that all three of our incumbents will be seeking re-election. And uh, if anyone has any questions about board service or would like more information, certainly contact any one of us or go on to the Iowa Association uh, School Board website. It has a lot of good information out there. Okay, next I have a request to address the board. Larry Winklowski, please come up and state your name and address for the record. Minutes, please. Sure, uh, Lawrence Winklowski, 4234 Monroe Road, Northeast Cedar Rapids. Um, let's start off by sharing a comment my daughter made, and I'm sure uh, you've heard this all before, and that is um, she came home one day from school and she said, did I know that prisoners ate better than she does in, at um, lunch? And I thought that was pretty comical that she said that. Um, unfortunately, it's truthful, and I wish some lawmakers would understand that. Um, another comment I'd like to say is uh, that, you know, typically the board is presented with the calendar the uh, last Friday, our last meeting of August, which is, happens to always be the day before the first day of school, and I'm requesting that it be put presented to uh, the school board earlier so that if people want to comment on it at a meeting, they'd have time. Um, that's such a crazy night that uh, most people don't even think about it because there's so many things they're for forgetting to do for the first day of school. 
Um, I looked over the activity uh, fund re, uh, financial report, and um, you know, I realized that they're not all closed out for the year, and uh, there should be some carryover year to year. But uh, you know, I looked at some of these funds, and they have a real lot of money in it. Um, the money in the funds for our th three largest high schools runs between uh, 172 and 429 thousand dollars. In the middle schools, it's 67 to 158 thousand um, dollars. It appears that these funds uh, have a fair amount of cash this year, and, uh, uh, and have, have actually made a fair amount of cash this year, and you know more than like a one or two percent. And in the case of Kennedy, the um, the revolving fees fund um, increased by $120,000. Um, not 100% sure what this fund does, but if we're charging people, uh, students' fees, and we're not using them, maybe we should drop the fees. Um, and I ha did not get an opportunity to request to look at the labor agreements or uh, that you're going to ask to approve tonight. Um, but I'm making an assumption based on the previous contracts, and that is when it comes to holidays, that all the um, holidays are not the same for all the labor agreements. And, that, and I really think that they should be. I, I, it's not efficient to have a, uh entity where you have different groups of people having different holidays. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Next, we have the consent agenda. This is a roll call action due to the personnel report, but I ask at this time if any board member would like anything pulled or if they have any comments or questions on any of the items presented. <coughs> this is a roll call action. Director Ann Halt. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Rosenthal? Aye. President Meisterling? Aye. And Dr. Benson, I'll turn our Iowa Transformation Ed Team over to you okay thank you we are uh, pleased this evening uh, to be uh, 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 have a presentation by Sean you come to the podium and uh, uh, we've been working with uh, uh, individuals to try to expand the opportunities for students uh, particularly around the issues of competency-based education uh, which is a, uh, an issue that I hold a very strong uh, passion around that we should, uh, uh, and I know that everybody here has probably heard me, we should get out of the seat time business, uh, at least at our senior highs, and get into the idea or the issue that students who demonstrate competency should be awarded uh, credit uh, based on what they know and what they can do. Uh, rather than how long they've sat in a chair. And uh, we're going to uh, uh, move uh, 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 in that direction. And uh, Sean is here, and uh, Dr. O'Malley has been working on this. Uh, so uh, perhaps Dr. O'Malley could join uh, Sean. And uh, if there's any questions at the uh, end, uh, uh, he can uh, uh, help provide a district perspective uh, 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 as the coordinator for the high schools this last year. So, Sean, with that, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Thanks. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Sean Cornelli. Um, I taught most of my time in public education at Solon High School, um, and I've recently resigned that position to work on this project. Um, Iowa Transform Ed is a sub-brand of the Gazette companies here in Cedar Rapids. Um, it's a, an initiative designed to explore what it looks like to tie the education community together with the business community, together with many other communities, in, a, in effect, to make schools different, to make schools uh, serve a, a different group of students that perhaps that, uh, they could do a better job serving. Um, and uh, throughout 2012 and 2013, uh, Iowa Transform Ed conducted what we called the Billy Madison Project, which is sort of a tongue-in-cheek reference to the Adam Sandler film. Uh, and Universal Pictures uh, stopped us from using the name, actually. And so we changed it to the Back to School Project, which is now a Rodney Dangerfield <laughs> reference. But we haven't heard from him. Um, so uh, the, the core idea behind the, the uh, Billy Madison Project was we, we took 40 uh, business leaders from the area, Iowa City and Cedar Rapids and the surrounding communities, and we put them back to school for a day. Um, and we asked them to shadow a student, do what the student did, 
uh, live through a student's day, take tests, do all, you know, do the whole thing, and then come back with us and help us talk about how we can integrate the, the business community and uh, the nonprofit community and the policy legislation, you know, community. How can we put those together better? Um, and the, the 40 people had all these crazy ideas and, you know, bizarrely different ideas, but they all said the same four things when we, we hashed it out. Um, and the overlap was about things like students learning soft skills and being put in, into experiences that, that push those soft skills, like email and, you know, the kind of sort of emotional intelligences that, that go along with working on a team. Uh, the, every single person identified um, time management as something students appeared to uh, be really wrestling with and doing, you know, some doing well at, some doing poor with. Um, the ability to fail gracefully, and the ability to have sort of an entrepreneurial mindset, and especially our, our business leaders. Um, uh, for instance, we had the, the um, his name eludes me now, but he's putting up the Genetrics building in Nubo um, right now, and he, you know, he pr stressed this idea. Isn't it Eric? Eric Engelman. Eric, yeah. Uh, he stressed this idea that we need, we need kids who are thinking entrepreneurially, even if they're in an employee of a company. And we thought to ourselves, you know, our high schools do a fairly good job of teaching these ideas, but they, they definitely weren't designed specifically for these ideas. And so we wondered, what would a school look like if we designed it that was uh, around these ideas? Next slide, please. Um, and uh, so the Iowa Transfer Med team sat down with educators uh, in the corridor with the Cedar Rapids Community School District, and we said, what, is, what does a school like this look like? And we realized this school should be designed around what kids do. You know, we have a fantastic education system that teaches a lot of content. Um, I teach physics and calculus and computer programming at Solon, and I know what it means to deliver content to students. Um, that's a, a, a knack, it's a craft, and I believe in teaching. But I also believe that there's a, a brand of education that puts uh, doing and applying and things like that above content. Um, and by that, I do not mean to say that our schools do a poor job by any means of any of these things. I just feel that a school designed specifically for doing uh, will look a little bit different and is worth uh, running a pilot through. Um, that said, we, we talked a lot about, you know, how will students interact with this school? How will they interface with it? You know, will it be a system uh, like other schools have tried in the area where the kids leave their school and actually go to this school within a school? Uh, will they, and we, we were uncomfortable with that. We wanted to have an educational option for these students. We wanted to have, we, we kept using the, the verbiage of uh, vitamin, uh, a supplement to go with the already fantastic education that the students were already receiving at their normal high school. So to, uh, as we're designing this experience, we're designing something for doing and we're designing something that is a supplement to uh, what the student is already doing uh, at their local high school. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, we wanted to lay down the, the core ideas uh, of what this school would do and we said that it would have integrated content uh, in that the students would never ever be able to see or avoid the, the sort of siloing of math from science and psychology from whatever other class. We wanted them all to be connected. We wanted to have a community audience to help um, the students know why and where their knowledge was applicable. Uh, we wanted to have resume building experiences so that when the students graduated or left the program, they would have something to take with them that they were truly proud of. We wanted to design something, therefore, that was project-based and competency-based. The students are, are owning a project. They're, they're doing something that has a, an end goal in mind and they work towards it until it's finished. Um, and finally, we wanted it to be lensed by student interest, which is a fantastic way to sort of breed that internal motivation and uh, stick to with their soft skills. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's an example project, uh, and this is a, a student is working on this right now. Uh, we're running with about 15 students um, currently in, in uh, the Big Ideas School, which is what we've decided, uh, decided to call it with the acronym BIG. Uh, and BIG has about 15 students from uh, all over the corridor. We have students from Mount Vernon, Solon, Cedar Rapids, Linmar, Marion, that are coming together at the Vault co-working space in downtown Cedar Rapids. And this is just an example of a, a work a student is doing. Um, he came to me uh, one day and he had heard about BIG and he said, you know, I read this psychology article about um, emotions and how our faces are, are naturally sort of hung a certain way and people interpret you as to having emotion even though you're just having a flat affect. And he was really interested by that and how people might immediately have prejudices against each other just based on um, those kinds of things and how that might, you know, cross-culturally cause problems. And it was a very interesting psychology problem. And I said, well, man, how, you know, how are we going to research that? And he's like, I don't know, I'm going to need like a million pictures of faces. How am I going to do that? And I said, well, you know, you could use a computer. And he didn't, you know, he had no computer programming experience. And so we said, well, let's, let's have a computer draw a face for you and have it be randomized and have it change up and down and left and right and the eyes will move. And this student had no experience with programming. 
uh, or really with psychology, or he had no idea that the statistics was coming down the pike to you know, deal with that at the end. So he and I built this website together. Uh, he had no programming experience. Um, the, the website uh, shows a random face and then allows a, the user to pick a, an emotion, and then it remembers that data. So this student is working with um, backends and web programming and all sorts of things that he had no idea he was going to have to use. Uh, and, and at this point, you know, he's now been promoting the project for a couple of days now, and he has over 2,000 responses, uh, which he did through a social media campaign, which he also had no idea marketing was going to be a part of this project. And so this kind of, uh, this example, I think, is the perfect sort of example of the synergy that we, we love to create at, at BIG. Um, next slide, please. What I really love about this project is that it, it shows how competency-based ed um, can be done. It shows that it, it, it's something the student persists with until they're finished and they've, they've gotten the proficiency. Um, and another reason that I think that this pilot is exciting and, ve and I'm very much excited to be, to be going with it. I actually just finished working with students uh, just a minute ago before I came here. Um, is that the Iowa Department of Education is putting some serious money and, and grants behind the idea of, of doing competency-based ed. And so I think it's the appropriate time to be pushing a pilot like this. Next slide, please. Um, we believe in student interest. This project that the student is doing with uh, their, their face website, is, it's, it was his idea. And as a mentor, I helped call that and pull that in a direction that, that touched content and met proficiencies from the, the common core that he had no idea he was going to be meeting. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, he has a community audience. I mean, he can't do this project without displaying it to the entire world and putting it on the internet and having people interact with it and give him data and give him feedback. Uh, two day, uh, one day into it, he got an email from a programmer um, who saw it on Twitter and said, hey, you know, you should make these changes to, to get your data better and have it run faster, which was, and it was amazing for him. He had no idea he was going to have that experience. So we believe that community audience uh, really lends some validity to what the students are doing. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, the content is integrated. Like, there's no way for him to pull the psychology away from the statistics, away from the programming. Um, and, and for me, as an educator, I've been working for five years, uh, six years now in public education. And this kind of content integration is just the, it's something I'm passionate about. And I, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to run a pilot like this. Um, next slide, please. And just a, a few remaining logistics about how uh, the school operates. Uh, there's a few things that are, are very divergent from how a, a traditional high school operates. Um, first, one thing that's not divergent is that it's staffed by licensed and endorsed uh, teachers and administrators. Uh, personally, I'm licensed in science and math, and those are the courses and mentorships that I take on. Um, this is an option that is congruent with student coursework. So this isn't a, something where a student you know, removes themselves from their normal curriculum and says, I'm going to go to big for a year. That is not how it works. This is a student that says, you know, I learn math, and I'd like to learn math in a more hands-on, community-focused kind of way. I want to just take one math class at big. I'm going to stay enrolled at Kennedy. I'm going to graduate with my class at Kennedy. I'm going to play sports at Kennedy. But I'm going to take math at big, just for one semester, maybe a whole couple years, uh, to let the student ease in and out of, of the program as they wish. Uh, which is very different than some of the implementations at um, other districts that have tried something like this. Uh, we have uh, asynchronous attendance, uh, which is by far the most divergent and disruptive element to BIG. Um, our students show up on Monday or Tuesday to have a planning session with their mentor, and they show up on Fridays to have a symposium with the other students to talk about their projects. The days in between are co-planned with their mentor and happen at different times during the day depending on um, the student's project. Um, finally, our home is at Vault Coworking, which is the co-working space in the Guarantee Bank and Trust Building on 3rd and 3rd. Um, it's a very fun area. The students really love the sort of like kitschiness of going downtown and going up to the 5th floor. You'd be surprised how, like, how impressive that is to them. Um, and then we imagine that 25 to 75% of a student's coursework could be done at BIG if they chose. Uh, but we also uh, firmly believe that this is something that is a supplement to the already awesome work that's happening at the local high schools. We don't, we don't see this as supplanting or changing or removing that experience. And so I just I want to take this opportunity to say I'm really excited to be on this team, be working together at the Gazette Company, Iowa Transform Ed, the Cedar Rapids Community School District. Um, it's just really exciting to me. Thank you. Other programs that we're doing out of Kirkwood this fall and and
you know, I, I could see students starting to get a little bit, I got this one, I'm working on that, which is great. You know, mm -hmm. they do better when they're busy, but I'm just wondering how we're merging all this in with uh, the, the activities. Yeah, I bet have. Gary has a better answer than me. Oh, you want me to? I'll, t I'll just say one thing. Uh, I, the Iowa Transform Ed team, uh, as a group of, of educational thinkers, believes in options for students. You know, I, I think that there's no way for one school to, to perfectly serve every student. I mean, our schools serve every student, but to really efficiently serve them. Um, there needs to be a, a, just a plethora of options. And I, we're seeing that explode in the corridor right now. And I, I, as a teacher, I'm just sort of like excited. I can't believe that there is big is happening and the community, uh, the, the Kirkwood partnership is happening and the University of Iowa is doing crazy things on their you know, Oakdale campus. And that's just so exciting to me because kids are seeing that education can happen in a million different ways in a million different places. Um, and so I see it fitting together just sort of as the, this you know, Mosaic. plethora. I can't wait. Sorry. Is it 1970s? The future. Um, it doesn't merge. It's probably not the, the, the word Keith that we would use. Uh, uh, Sean, I think, said it best when he talked about a variety of options. Uh, Kirkwood is built on the old model of uh, seat time. It's built on sequence of courses. It's just a natural part of, of how we do things. But if you think about the difference between higher ed, uh, how we certify a master's candidate with a group of, of folks who just sign off with a signature, uh, how we do dissertations and doctoral study, how we do undergraduate education, how that's significantly different than how we do pre-K-12. Whole different set of systems built in. What this does is this allows us to say, what are some unique things that we can do based on personalizing education for the individual that might present them some options that we hadn't thought of before? And the future of, uh, of, an, of education for our kids needs to be embraced, I believe, by those of us in ties with those who are the excellent teachers that we know who can provide a different experience for our kids based on what service piece they might use connected to community problems in a different way than simply the learning of content knowledge. Keywords he used, application, uh, practical real world, world benefit, uh, a community <coughs> emphasis. That's not a merger of what we currently have, Keith. It's not even an extension of what we have. It's a different look at what we should have. And I encourage us to think about more conversations where we focus the student first around what the student might need in a practical sense instead of simply preparing them for another classroom, preparing them for life. Gary? Um, I'm really excited about this project. Uh, for the last several years, I've had the opportunity to look at some high-tech, high, -tech, high um, uh, projects going around the country and that's uh, a little bit grander scale but uh, I had hoped that that this that some of our students in this community would have at least an opportunity to uh, to experience the the project base it's it's real world learning uh, I believe it it's, it has some life skills that uh, will really carry forth uh, I think it's a great way to to start integration to, and uh, looking forward to seeing how it uh, how it develops and how it grows, and uh, uh, I congratulate you on, on moving forward with this project. I'll just apologize for being late. So uh, if one of your students could work on a project on the traffic congestion from Iowa City <laughs> to Cedar Rapids, I'd greatly appreciate that, as would many thousands of others. You know but, they might. but nonetheless, um, I think it this does put some of the onus on us to make sure that our school counselors at the middle school and K-12 level, high school level, understand the benefits of this and the reasons for this and that they can be encouraging to the proper students and parents why this might be a benefit. Otherwise, we're going to have students, I think, just like with the Kirkwood program, that don't quite understand it and will fall back into that traditional, comfortable m mode that we've all been in. So um, I hope uh, we're prepared to do that work. And uh, again, I think as a parent who has kids in the district, they're the ones that we're listening to along with the other parents who, in this case, won't have 
probably had a chance to go through anything like this in their lives. So, If I could interject with that, uh, I'd like to be on the record explicitly stating that this is an option designed for the full spectrum of Cedar Rapids and Corridor students. Um, we don't view this as programming for any specific ability level, for any specific, you know, however you want to, you know, relegate students into to categories. Uh, we think that within every ability level, every home circumstance, that there are students, students that really want to and would benefit from learning this way. And so we expect to see, or hope to see, an accurate representation of the cross-section of the CRCSD. Well, and I think John's point is how do we get that message out every year and make sure that students understand what that option actually means. And um, the other thing I'd like you just to touch upon, if you would, is the ability for students as they, as they go through their program choice with BIG that they still meet Common Core, they will have assessments that are mm -hmm. similar to ours and in, in the traditional classroom. Indeed. So a really great example um, is I'm working with a Cedar Rapids student today. Actually, she, it was her first day. And she elected that uh, she would like to try to earn a credit in basic physics because she knows that she would like to take AP physics. And so she'd like to do that over the summer to be prepared to, to take that next level. And I thought, well, you know, it's really prescient of her. Like, let's do that. Uh, in her other project, she said, you know, I don't know what class this is, but I'm really interested in how theology connects with biology. And I thought, oh, like, as a science <laughs> teacher, those are your red flags. And you're like, oh, okay, like, this is okay. Let's learn about this, but let's be very careful. Um, and so it, it, in, in her, there was this perfect dichotomy between how we would present content. She had this thing she was genuinely interested in that I knew she could get some very serious social studies and biology information out of. But I wasn't sure how that was going to turn into a course. And she had this other need where to, to learn from a, a, a really common, already predefined set of standards. And so her and I actually went straight to the Cedar Rapids curriculum and the, the core set of standards that physicists or physics teachers use from the Association of Physics Teachers. And we laid those out for her. And I said, here are the core standards. You know, I've designed some projects that I think will be great for you to meet these three. And she started to think about questions she had about these other four. Um, and then we started to sort of brainstorm with her other projects, the, the biology one. What were some of the common core standards that really popped out at her from that project? And so in that way, we are always referencing back to one of the sort of, uh, you know, standard curricular sources. Uh, this is definitely not sort of us just playing around doing whatever project we feel like. You know, the, at the end of their semester or trimester at BIG, we expect them to have earned the competencies that amount to a standard high school credit. Thank you. And if they haven't, then they should keep going until they do. Mm -hmm. That's the competency-based yeah. part, yeah. right? That's right. 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 Um, Dave, did you have any comments? Just uh, a couple of comments. One, I would liken this to uh, a mosaic. Uh, some of what we do is very lineal. Most of what we do is been lineal. This is an opportunity for us to break out of that and to add some student choice and create a, a more diversified mosaic of opportunities uh, regarding the uh, uh, gatekeeping function yes we have gatekeepers at our institution and every institution ha uh, has those uh, individuals but I am convinced that students vote with their feet they will go to where they think that there are competent caring edu educational professionals <coughs> and they get a better educational product this is an opportunity for us to try something uh, fairly low stakes in terms of our financial commitment, uh, in terms of our uh, 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 students uh, uh, initially. But uh, if they get a good thing out of it, the word of mouth, uh, it will grow. Uh, I'm convinced of that. And I want to emphasize that we do have an expectation that any credit that we uh, uh, give through this program is uh, standards-based. Uh, and meets uh, all of the rigor uh, that a uh, course would demand uh, in taken in a more traditional sense. And we've been very clear with uh, the team leaders and Sean on this project. Um, I do have one more question. I know other schools across the state have um, implemented like a G squared program. Can you tell me the difference between big and G squared? Mm -hmm. The core philosophies are very similar, right? Okay. You want students working on similar projects that tie many content areas together. But the, the, there are some implementation differences that we, think, um, that we think fit better with this population. And that is, one, that the student doesn't have to elect to leave the general ed population, um, which has been a hallmark of some of the other, as you said, G-squared programs. The student says, I'm either a G-squared student 
or I'm a, mm -hmm. you know, traditional or whatever word you want to use. We don't, we don't believe in that. We say, you know what, if you want to take sixth period math with us, you might not come every day during sixth period, but, you know, that's the, the time that's carved out of your day that would have been sort of devoted to these ideas. Um, and so you would stay at Kennedy for your other five periods or however many they're taking. Um, we don't believe in canned projects, and that, might, that actually might come across a little pejorative, and I don't mean that that way. Um, it's like sort of an education term, right? The, what I mean by that is the, in a G squared program, they would sort of decide the, the way that the projects would play out throughout the year in a, a sort of in a, a seemingly good-natured way to make sure you hit the entire curriculum. Um, I, I have no worries. I've taught in a project-based, competency-based, standards-based classroom for six years at Solon. And I know that, that, if anything, they go way too fast. Right? The kids get competencies too quick. And so you end up in April, and you're like, oh, man, I guess I'll teach Calculus 3. <laughs> Here we go. Um, and so that, you know, I'm not worried about things like that as far as planning the curriculum. I know that the kids move quickly when they, when they love what they're doing. Um, so in that sense, we don't use canned projects. The students come to us. We really spend a lot of time learning them. Uh, today was the first day for a lot of students in the summer program. And they, I, I'd probably talked to each of them for an hour, hour and a half to just find out what they're into, what are they doing, what are they about, um, and try to avoid any of that sort of reductionist of you know, the teenage mind, right, which is impossible to do. Um, so we don't use canned projects. Our students don't have to leave the gen ed population. And our students are allowed to go in and out. Um, and we believe that the products of these projects are something that truly builds their resumes. It builds their applications for whatever post-secondary option they're looking at. Um, and that's something that's at the very core of what we do. Um, the, students, uh, uh, the students I'm most excited about going to college are the students that I've worked closely with on projects that um, are so beyond the curriculum that it's not even about a class anymore. I have a student going to Iowa this fall on a full ride because she did physics education research with me all last year. Uh, she was interested in sort of gender roles in physics and how that plays out as females choose to take more physics. And she did a legitimate full-fledged research report on it, and the faculty at Iowa just looked at it and said, come here, please. And that kind of thing, you know, I can't, you, obviously you can't promise that for every student, but I don't know that she would have had that opportunity without a, a sort of big mindset in the classroom. Um, so, yeah. Okay, great. Any other Mer comments? Yes, Gary. Sean, what's the, um, what's the staff at uh, the Big Ideas Group? Is it, is it just you, or is there other instructors currently? Currently, it's myself and educator Trace Pickering, um, who's an administrator and a licensed English teacher. And we've been talking with the team uh, between um, Iowa Transform Ed and Cedar Rapids about what that staff should look like in the fall, because we know we'd like to start with a smaller pilot, something to really test the waters, take good data, you know, have something to really act on if we're going to make this scalable. Um, so we'd like to see you know, 2.0 FTE assigned to this project and maybe you know, half of each content area. So I would be half math and science, half English, half social studies, and a half art time, or art teacher, uh, depending on how what we want to go with that. Um, we also could see a, the initial pilot being just STEM, and so we would need just a, a math and science teacher and perhaps one other personnel. Right, we've posted for, uh, to fill out the core uh, with a social science teacher. Um, you know, science, math, social science, and uh, actually Trace Pickering brings the uh, language arts uh, to the table. But we've, we've done some posting, and we'll, we'll see how that develops in the next few weeks. But we'd like to see all of the core disciplines covered so that it, uh, these projects can truly be interdisciplinary. Yeah, how does the um, process work for a student applying or getting chosen? And then also, um, as far as any fees that might go with that, if that's paid by the family or that's something the district takes care of like they do with some other things? All of that is under discussion right now, as right. far as I we're, know. We're working, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, that's right. Uh, yep. Sorry to use that term. The, the, there's a lot of sub-details. Uh, we're trying to hit the, the broad brush tonight so the board has an understanding, and we hope to bring this back uh, in a few months, and we'll start filling in those details. Okay. Please do bring it back. <laughs> yeah, Sean, thank you so much. We Thanks appreciate your time. Uh, your time tonight and sharing this program with us, and we're very excited to see that launch in the fall. Thanks. Yep. Okay, next I'll turn this over to Sherry Lusky, and she's going to present our district audit committee report. Hi. 
Well, that's a fine project to follow. I'm Sherry Lusky, Accounting Manager, and it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce Patrick Courtney, our President of the Audit Committee, Barb Harms, <coughs> Audit Committee Member, and Tom Hoffman, the incoming President this fall. They are here to present the Audit Committee Report, the Annual Report to the Board of Education. Patrick? Thanks, Sherry. Um, my name is Pat Courtney. I served as the chairman of the audit committee for the past uh, year. And um, I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to make sure I introduce Tom Hoffman and Barb Harms, who are uh, committee members that served uh, this past year. Um, also, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Steve Graham and Cherry for all of their efforts in uh, meeting and providing uh, detailed information to the audit committee during the past year. To be quite truthful, without their help, because there's a couple of the issues that I'll talk about briefly here in a few minutes, it would have been very difficult to function as a committee this past year, and they have been always very forthcoming and helpful with regard to information that they provided. I would like, also like to thank uh, Director Onhalt with regard to his attendance at the meetings and providing uh, insight and uh, addressing questions. Um, as part of the audit committee meeting, uh, we do meet at the end of each session with uh, the assigned director and also the independent auditor to review and discuss independently without any uh, Cedar Rapids community staff being present any issues that uh, the committee felt needed to be addressed uh, independently in, in an executive session. Um, I think our biggest uh, question or issue that we kind of addressed this year, which was that during the course of the year, the, the, we had an internal auditor. She resigned. Um, there was a process started where an effort was made to hire a successor internal auditor and that that wasn't really uh, forthcoming and so ultimately because of some financial issues that I think clearly the district uh, was facing and that the committee clearly recognized exist the decision was finally made that at this time not to rehire an internal auditor for the school district while the committee clearly recognizes the financial issues that, are, that affect that decision, the committee also does believe that, um, that a, an internal auditor at some point is clearly uh, something that we would like to see in place. We are dealing with um, an entity that has, you know, I guess, gross assets over $340 million, revenues in, in excess of $200 million, and it probably is an appropriate thing for an internal auditor to deal with and to address, especially when you consider uh, that a lot of uh, the resources that go through are cash-based and driven, and that's where we can cause the biggest issues or uh, problems. And the purpose, I think, of an internal auditor is always to provide checks and balances uh, in that situation. So not that we request or demand or require an internal auditor. It's just something to keep in mind in the future as uh, the financial situation of the district changes over time. Um, you should have a packet of materials uh, that, uh, that provides the audit committee's report. Attached there, too, is the charter of the audit committee and also a matrix of the responsibilities of the uh, audit committee and what it functions and what it needs to function each year. As part of the audit committee report, we've attached or we've listed, I think, three or six, excuse me, six basic accomplishments that we wanted to bring uh, to the, uh, the board's uh, attention. First of all is, is part of the process, which I think is in vitally important, as part of the independent auditor's uh, functions, in addition to the independent audit that they, uh, that they do issue, they do do an audit of the activity funds for basically Kingston, the high school, and the middle schools. 
and they provided that report to us. And I would have to say that uh, the, com the audit committee reviewed it. And basically, there's, from what we can see, there is probably um, the schools are doing a very good job as far as managing or controlling the, the, the accountings. Um, the only, you know, there's a few minor discrepancies about, you know, turning the cash back box back in and checking with the ticket sales. But uh, that was a few, to, a few minor things there. They're probably the only other issue, which is, I think, really in discussing with the Cedar Rapids community staff, is that uh, some of each of the schools have, a, have their activity funds some particular programs within the overall school program will run a negative balance at a particular time. Uh, however, those are usually corrected and it's more of a timing issue uh, simply because the fine arts hasn't collected all of the money for um, a program. And so uh, we, we do check with the staff and they do uh, confirm that I think overall there is a, a reconciliation of the funds periodically throughout the year, which is our biggest uh, goal. Um, the other thing um, the, which we review uh, with the um, independent auditor is the forthcoming accounting initiatives that may affect the, the school district. And one that is noted is the the obligation not only for nonprofits but also for for-profit corporations is the obligation to reflect uh, potential future pension liability going forward. And we have talked to the in independent auditor while the district is part of IPERS. Right now, there is no uh, quantifiable number that indicate what that potential uh, liability that would have to be reflected on the school district's balance sheet. But the audit committee uh, questioned the auditor and, uh, and had followed up uh, to determine that over the last few years, I think uh, the contribution rate uh, for the district has increased and that uh, a lot of the, um, the issues or concerns about how this pension liability, if reflected on the balance sheet, would affect the, uh, the bond rating of the district um, is probably already taken into account according to the independent auditor. So while there will be you know, some clear issues that will have to be addressed over the next year as the independent auditors uh, figure out what, how to quantify that, uh, that potential liability, they, at least they've led us to believe that it should not have any dramatic impact on the uh, financial condition or the financing uh, or bond financing that the uh, district uh, may face going forward. I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Tom Hoffman, who's going to address a couple other issues, and then Barb, Barb Harms will address a couple of the other uh, matters that we wanted to bring to the board's attention, and then we'll be glad to address any questions or comments. Thanks, Pat. <clears throat> I want to hit a couple highlights, uh, one on the insurance side and the other on the um, uh, auditor side as well, and, and uh, make some, some brief remarks. Um, <clears throat> the uh, highlight number three in your packet is uh, the, the district reviewed its risk insurance program with the insurance carriers' representatives. And in previous years, uh, there were significant issues with the workers' compensation program and claims and some safety concerns. And through some aggressive uh, policies, processes, and procedures, I think the, uh, there's now some uh, very good programs in place to reduce the amount of claims and, and uh, going towards the workers' compensation program and improving worker safety. And I think that's, those are very, very critical, uh, obviously, once from a financial side and the others, clearly from a, a risk and, and safety standpoint from the uh, employees. And as a result, the workers' compensation claims are starting to trend down, which uh, ultimately uh, reduces workers' compensation premiums and, and can save the district money as well. Uh, the next item is uh, we reviewed with the independent auditor their annual audit and, and uh, regarding problems or difficulties of which there were none uh, for them to do their job and perform in their audits. So we're, we're pleased with that. We're pleased with the cooperation of uh, all the staff and, and uh, pleased with 
the results and, and cer certainly with our auditors. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Barb. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Just to hit on the last couple of items, um, after the decision of, to eliminate the district's internal auditor, we felt it was important to um, reinforce the communication to from the district about the fiscal accountability website, um, that that was you know, the primary reporting uh, mechanism for staff to address any issues. So there was recent communication about that website and as a result of that at our last meeting we did have a couple of reports to review and the district always does a fantastic job of, of addressing those and um, letting the committee know about those um, any reports on that system also um, we have over the last several years really focused on the um, deficiencies that were identified by the auditors uh, um, after uh, the 2009 audit and that list has really whittled down to now just really the fixed asset system and so we've had a lot of discussion and focused on that this last year um, the physical inventory was recently completed and I know they're in the fi final stages of implementing the software to reconcile the um, district inventory so we spent um, a lot of time focusing on that this year as well so with that, we'd be happy to address any questions that the board would have. Good report. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from board members? Keith? I have a question about upcoming health care and all the regulations and everything that will follow with that, potential penalties and so on. Um, have you looked at that? I'll address it a little bit. Just Barb, can you speak into the microphone? Oh, Thank you. I am um, part of the MIP board um, uh, as the Grantwood AEA representative, and I know with Cedar Rapids being part of that, the MIP board has had a lot of discussion about health care reform and the initiatives that are going to be required. Um, at this point, um, we feel that the MIP plans um, meet all of the requirements that have already been um, put in place. A lot of the ones that are coming up are still, the rules are still being written, so there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, we are monitoring that very closely, and um, each entity kind of has to look at how that's going to impact um, their employee groups as far as how, how they determine funding of their um, insurance um, but we are monitoring that very closely on a, from a MIP board aspect. Tom, I know you're in insurance. Um, do you have any comments? It's not going to get any easier, but I don't <laughs> think that's any <laughs> prognostication there. Uh, no, I think it's, it's um, being, in, being in the uh, field quite a bit, is there are certain employers that have not really done much, but it sounds like uh, from your standpoint that you've done quite a bit of research and preparing for uh, 2014 and, and uh, maybe even some, some things down in, when it comes to additional taxes going out as far as 20, 2018 and, and Cadillac taxes and things like that. Uh, but again, I think aggressive uh, management and review of those programs, contributions, and then a full understanding of the taxes and, and uh, fees is very, very important. And uh, again, I haven't been involved with the MIP discussions, but I can tell you those employers that, that haven't uh, spend time doing that and there are many um, I'm, I was, I'm pleased to hear that there's been aggressive management from and uh, research from from this end okay other questions or comments from other board members Gary uh, I just want to say on behalf of the board uh, to thank not only uh, Tom um, uh, Patrick and um, and Barb but the rest of the committee uh, this is a volunteer committee that from uh, the public that's uh, helping us to ensure that we're fiscally responsible and, and uh, we appreciate your time and uh, your, um, your expertise that you bring uh, in helping us to make sure that we uh, are adequately and, and uh, diligently serving the community. That, that's what I was going to say. Well, <laughs> I beat you to it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do want to reiterate that. Thank you for your time. We truly are a community school district when we, when we invite our community in to help us 
uh, become better informed and help us make better decisions. So, Pat, thank you for your service as, as chair. And Tom, thank you very much for stepping in as, as incoming chair. The only thing I can say is you must have missed a meeting, Tom. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you got an assignment. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much for coming. Thank, thank you. you for your work. Thank you. That's great. Okay, next I'm going to turn this over to Sandy Stephen to talk about the School Improvement Advisory Committee report. Thank you, President Meisterling, Dr. Benson, members of the board. Uh, as you know, the School Improvement Advisory Committee is required by the Iowa Code, and it's comprised of students, parents, teachers, administrators, and community stakeholders. Uh, and their role is to provide information to the board and make recommendations about a variety of topics. Last year, uh, the committee uh, reviewed these areas, the major educational goals, the student learning goals, and long-range goals in reading, mathematics, and science, and also the student achievement related to those goals and made some recommendations to the board. This year, the focus of the committee was on, uh, I don't know exactly where this goes, bullying and harassment prevention, uh, goals, programs, training, and other initiatives. So we met this spring and took a look at the reports that had been submitted on bullying and, har bullying and harassment. And um, essentially we discovered that there were approximately 46 incidents reported. And of those 46 incidents, 21 were elementary, 12 middle school, and 13 high school. Um, this was a little bit complicated by the fact that there may have been several reports for one incident. So we had to be kind of careful that uh, we weren't counting incidents more than once in our data analysis. But we did have some kind of summary things that we observed from that information. One, uh, the most targeted characteristic was typically a physical trait or uh, attribute, and sometimes it was gender related. The most common method that was a verbal um, harassment by students. It typically occurred in classrooms and hallways and occasionally on the playground or in the gym. And uh, the most common consequence was a verbal warning, usually followed by a conference or a conference with the counselor and occasionally uh, with a conference with the parent involved. The uh, committee, based on this review, then made several recommendations, and some of these are basically to continue some of the practices that are currently being implemented. Um, we're posting the policy in every school, and they recommended that we continue that, that we continue to implement the Doing Our Part program in K through 8, that the PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention and Support Program, um, be expanded and that we continually train new teachers and uh, administrators um, to recognize bullying and harassment. Um, we think that in some instances, students themselves aren't really aware of what bullying and harassment is, and it may be over-reported, uh, particularly at the elementary level. In addition, they're recommending that we get some feedback from students, teachers, and parents, and administrators on the effectiveness of the in interventions that we've already put in place, and that we encourage all schools to implement the PBIS program. And this requires that um, we have a significant buy-in by staff in those schools. So um, we really need to, to try to encourage people to take a look at that. We need to make certain that our new employees receive training so that they know what to look for and how to be uh, reporting it and investigating it. And ensure that parents are always contacted instead of occasionally contacted or contacted towards the end of the investigation. They also recommended that, and we've talked about this for many years, that we provide training and cultural competency for staff and that students uh, are aware and are more tolerant of differences um, of their uh, classmates because our diversity is increasing. And that we identify methods to monitor and address cyberbullying, which is really uh, doesn't always surface and may not be reported, but is clearly becoming a bigger issue. That we be proactive regarding neighborhood problems that mm -hmm. might come into the school, 
and that we provide parent education on social media, which is also a complicated, difficult thing to really get a handle on and provide that training. But those were the insights of that committee, and I shared them with the board. Do you have any questions or comments about any of that? Questions? John? So, so on the PBIS uh, implementation, why is it just being encouraged and not mandated that our schools implement that? I mean, where are we giving our schools the choice if it's felt that this will make a difference? I would defer to Mary Ellen on that, um, and I will say that there is a procedure for this that Grantwood AEA uh, that's involved primarily in the training requires that you have buy-in of about 90% of your staff. Yeah, to 80. Yes, correct. I don't think you're on. <laughs> Currently we have uh, all, all but one of our elementary schools has implemented PBIS, all six of our middle schools. And we currently have all of our high schools exploring PBIS um, this past spring and are looking at it for this fall. But you do have to have 85% of your staff uh, on board to implement. And we've received that support from Grantwood Area Education Agency, the professional development that goes along with that. The strengths of that program are, the, um, the, of course, the positive behavior support for um, uh, positive interactions as well as um, the support that it gives as a common language among in the school in general. Okay, so we're Thanks. headed in the direction. Okay. Of, it sounds like uh, most, most are on board. Absolutely. Okay. Other comments or questions? How I, do you, who's I, oh, in charge, I'm sorry, John? No, that's fine, go ahead. Who's in charge of making certain that all new employees are trained and how is that tracked? Well, I would, um, refer to Jill Cervillo on that, but there is a, a new employee training for teachers, new teacher training that occurs. Um, there are other groups that I think that probably is incorporated into their pre-service training, but I'd defer to you on that, Jill. We, we do have it incorporated into um, the pre-service training, and um, I don't provide the PBIS specifically, but uh, the time is provided during pre-service. And it's in the, I don't know how much training is done. The building, I'll defer to you on that in terms of the, how, how when an elementary school starts the program. Um, the PBIS training happens at the school level, and there are several days throughout the school year that uh, there's a PBIS team at each school. Um, generally at the elementary, that's a vertical team, um, and it uh, is actually part of the school improvement planning process for those schools as well. If you were to look at their SEB goals on their school improvement plan, implementation of positive behavior supports would be part of that. Um, the training um, varies. There's year one, year two, and year three in PBIS implementation. Year one is focused on the common language for the whole building and those common procedures in hallways, cafeteria, recess, um, and uh, even restrooms. Um, and then uh, the second year, we're looking at the implementation within classrooms. And then the third year of implementation is looking at those specific needs of students that are maybe uh, needing a little bit more support, more than the core um, support for behaviors. So that training, it's kind of a train the trainer model in some ways in that your core team goes to the training and um, that always involves the counselor and the administrator and then teaching support staff and it may be some uh, paraprofessional support staff as well. They come back and deliver the professional development and develop the building's plan for implementation with the whole staff. Every year. Every year, okay. yeah, and depending on where they are in that continuum, year one, year two, year three, or, or beyond. Okay, so if you're beyond and, and I'm a new teacher, where do I start? You start with the, with the building and the implementation plan where they are at. Okay. This is an area that really concerns me because the, um, the consequences of people that are bullied and harassed through their, any time in their K-12 experience has a lifelong lasting effect. And I think we need to be very, very diligent, and I'm not saying that we're not diligent, but I think we need to be very, very diligent in implementing this with a lot of integrity. 
I noticed that one of the recommendations from the team was to provide information annually for staff on bullying and harassment, and that's something we plan to do with the next school year. Yeah, and I think we need to share all this data, and I think I would love to see this um, kind of review every single year, and how are we doing? So we had 46 this year. How many do we have next year? And, and start tracking that to see if what we're doing is effective and, and protecting our students. So, Ann? Well, just to add to that, if there was an online training for teachers, that'd be a really easy, mm -hmm. e just a refresher or something, just an online thing, just to kind of, and it'd be easy to track, um, just as an idea. That is one of the things we do in pre-service. We have our safe schools courses that always include bullying and harassment, and those are updated. And then we look every year to see what courses they're going to take during pre-service. And so is that something that's required, or yes. that's optional? Mm -hmm. it's required. Okay. All right. Okay. Gary? Gary? Um, the cyberbullying, um, it's, it is a tough thing to, to, uh, to wrap your hands around, but I, I think it's an area that we're going to need to investigate more as we're seeing um, the courts being more uh, aggressive in, in the areas that we seem to, they seem to think that we now have to have supervision over and, 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 and take on, um, uh, expanding the roles uh, and the boundaries of, of where schools are and, and where we land. So it, the um, school administrators group does a really nice job annually of looking at this at their, during their legal labs and in their school law conferences. So school administrators of Iowa have, have looked at it pretty seriously. Uh, Matt Carver is a really good resource to administrators when it comes to cyberbullying. But I think a lot of it goes on and it only rarely surfaces. And when it does, then it becomes kind of a, a critical issue at that point. I, I have a question about transportation. Um, you know, the bus driver has a tremendous task there, but I know that is a place where you can have a lot of problems. Uh, as far as that is concerned, none of the incidents that were reported occurred on the bus. Uh, and I know that we have different systems in place to monitor that, but whether or not they're actually... Uh, reported by students or observed by other adults that it's difficult when there's only one adult on that bus. So what are we doing with bus drivers and transportation to be sure that it's not occurring on buses? I thought we had cameras on buses. Yeah, I was going to mm -hmm. I was going to say mm -hmm. not only does um, the transportation manager Denny Schreckengas have cameras on buses when I mean there are many times when he's asked me to view tapes and there are more than we think on, on buses. And we also hire bus attendants if we get any kind of word that there's problem between students. Um, so it's, it's, it's being monitored. In addition, we have been working with transportation for the past three years and during pre-service for our bus attendants and bus drivers. Our spe uh, special services and learning support staff provide overviews um, for all of those staff members in transportation about what is PBIS, um, how to address concerns. We use the, um, we look at uh, crisis management and those types of things in that training with all of our bus um, transportation staff that are driving the buses and, and uh, attendants on the buses. And I think it's uh, been supportive for them. We work on uh, sharing that common language that's being used in the schools, using the, that same common language on the buses as well. Um, as well as how to de-escalate situations and things like that. So there is training that occurs during pre-service and throughout the school year for those uh, transportation staff members. Thank you. Um, for those maybe listening in on this meeting, could someone tell us what PBIS is? Thank you, Mary. PBIS stands for Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. If you were to look on our website, there's uh, on our dashboard, there's a great deal of information not a great deal on the dashboard, but there's information about what positive behavior intervention supports is. And then there's a link because it is not only a Cedar Rapids program, of course, it's a national program and used in many, many school districts across the nation. Okay, thank you. Another question. I noticed one of the recommendations is be aware of neighborhood problems that may carry over into the school. Is there some type of notification or some 
Are the schools aware? I mean, how are they notified that there are problems within the neighborhood? We generally find out uh, from our families, from our students, mm -hmm. if that's hap if there's been a problem in the neighborhood, um, we become aware of that very quickly um, with the types of social media that are available, with emails, with phone calls from families. Um, as well, if we haven't heard about it from a family and the students bring it to school the next day, we quickly become aware of that and, and try to help address those problems uh, as well. Okay, thanks. Gary? Uh, just that I think, uh, as we found in other areas, that one of the keys to to, uh, to working with this problem is just ensuring that we have a, a caring, communicative staff that, that's open and, and willing to, to listen to students and to communicate with students. If the students have a, an adult within the building that they feel comfortable, that they can, uh, can go to and will be listened to and heard. And, and we've done a very good job of, uh, of establishing and having that kind of a staff. And it's, I think it's helped a long ways. And it's just something we need, need to continue. Just one last thought. I know that we're focusing on students. Is there any bullying and harassment training for uh, work groups, peer to peer? We have an online course mm -hmm. for that, too, okay. in That's safe right. schools. Great. OK, super. Thank I, you very much. I'm sorry? Well, I was just going to. The first thing on there is cultural competency training for our staff, and I guess that sort of relates to the next presentation as well, so maybe I'll wait till later for that one. But um, I know when the Department of Ed was here that SIAC was mentioned as one of the weaknesses in the school district, if I'm mistaken, Dr. Benson, and are we, is this report and the results of this report now meeting the intent for change from the Department of Ed's report? I mean, th this was one of the weaknesses I know that they brought out in their audit, right? Well, I think the um, SIAC committee was quite outspoken when they interviewed groups and felt that it was important that they have input into this process. And I would say yes, that for the past two years that we have addressed what's required by the code and you have received recommendations from a group that we know is balanced in terms of gender and ethnicity and all of those things. Okay. So I think we are addressing that. Okay. Thank you. Sandy, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate the information. Uh, next, I'm going to turn this over to Aaron Green to talk about the suspension expulsion report. <laughs> President Meisterling, Dr. Benson, members of the board, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about suspension and expulsion without actually bringing an expulsion to you. <laughs> I know that wasn't your favorite time to see me in past years. That's, that's true. So I kind of have a, a plan here. We'll see how well it works. I want to kind of define some terms because I think that people get confused and as I go through some of the data, it may get confusing as to how things got the way that they got. Um, some things may look like they got better, but we actually shifted some things, and so um, that'll account for it. When we talk about expulsions, expulsions are probably our, are definitely our, our most um, aggressive and the most serious way that we handle discipline in, the, in our district. Uh, years ago, and you'll see this as we went through our number, I think it was back in, let's see, it was 2006, seven, we had 24 expulsions for the district. And all of those expulsions sat before you. Uh, you actually dealt with all of those personally. We have, over the years, come up with different ways of addressing that. Uh, but expulsions are when we put students outside the district, they are excluded from the district. We have dealt with it in a different way in that we started looking at those kids that we were putting out even for up to a year and the fact that if you put them out for a year just remember in a year they're coming back to us and so it was kind of a catch-22 and so we recommended some time ago that we provide some educational services for those students and we've been doing that and I appreciate the support that you guys have provided <coughs> in providing that uh, 
educational support because we've been able to stay connected with those students uh, when they are, are dismissed from us uh, in an offsite. And so that has helped tremendously as far as the work that we do in dealing with those, uh, some of the most extreme students in this most extreme discipline. Well, one of the things that we also did was there are long-term suspensions. Long-term suspensions are anything over 10 days that have to come before the board uh, because anything up to nine days, we have the authority to suspend a student, uh, both the building and through our office through hearings. And so anything over 10 days has to come before the board and it has to be approved. And those are long-term suspensions. You'll notice as we start to talk about our data that our long-term suspensions since uh, 2009 have increased and they've increased considerably. And so that's gonna be one of those other areas. Uh, the last thing I'd like to define is office referrals. Now I'm not gonna give you a clean definition on office referrals because there's a little mud in the water when we start talking about these. Office referrals basically are when kids are sent out of the room to the office. Uh, sometimes those result in a report, sometimes they don't result in a report. The thing I'd like for you guys to focus on is that when we have kids outside the classroom, this is time that they are not learning. Uh, and we'll look at the, the disproportionate number of some of the office, office referrals. So last term I'm going to define for you, and this is not an original term, uh, but this is one that I got from one of our consultants because uh, as I used to come before the board with expulsions, I remember some board members that used to always make it a point to tell me, um, I hope I, not, I don't see you in the future. And so I understood that because that was a serious thing and those are difficult things. But this uh, consultant used the term CTBU, and that is call the baby ugly. Uh, we have some serious numbers that we're going to share with you, and th this, is, this is not fun stuff, but the reality of it is if we don't look at the numbers cleanly and look at where we are in our district, and this is not a problem that's just come on, on, uh, on the scene. This is something that's been going on and it's growing, and I want to caution the board that the numbers are going to only get worse unless we do something about them. And so I want to share some of my concerns, and some of my concerns are, um, one, the disproportionality of office referrals, uh, and you have some of that information in front of you. Uh, the disproportionate number of suspensions, uh, hearings, long-term suspensions, expulsions, and lastly, but um, I think very importantly, charges and arrests that take place through schools. Uh, we've, we are in constant communication with the uh, with juvenile court and they constantly share with us the updates on where we are as far as the number of arrests. And though arrests are down and charges are down with juveniles uh, in Lynn County, uh, the school district leads the way in charges against youth. Uh, where charges take place happen in schools. That's a concern of mine. Uh, I shared that when we talked about the SROs and I'm not gonna focus on the SROs, but um, we were, disproportionate before the SROs, we continue to be disproportionate. That's a concern of mine because I don't believe that school is a place where we should be uh, helping kids get into the juvenile justice system. When I deal with kids on, um, on discipline issues, I want to make sure that they understand that uh, that's not my system. This is my system. Education is the system that we want them to be successful in and not the juvenile justice system. I'm looking at the numbers and we're helping the juvenile justice system. We're helping kids get in there and that's a problem. That's an issue that I want us to, to consider and deal with. So as we look at the numbers and before we look at the numbers, the last thing I do want to say is that when I think of discipline, I'm thinking of it on, on the lines of teaching, some way of teaching a kid and trying to correct the kid. I'm not looking on the punishment side and I know that that comes into our thinking when we start to think about uh, discipline. But we have to look at discipline differently if we're going to be more successful with helping these kids. And so if we start to look at the numbers, and I also want you to think about the way that you want these numbers presented to you. I have them in a chart form right now, and I'm going to be reading them from you. Uh, I'm looking at the number of suspensions that uh, we have uh, and the number of students. So if we looked at our number of suspensions for this year, it's 14, 19, um, number of students that we suspended. Uh, the number of suspensions would be 2841. That's 2,841 suspensions this year. We're actually down from last year where it was 30, 40, 45. Uh, the suspensions have gone up and gone down over the years. Uh, the number of hearings, are, these are discipline level hearings that we have. This year they were down, they were at 185. Last year they were at 237. Uh, back in 2006 it was at 171. And so you'll see a little fluctuation with the, the hearings. 
TAP placement. And those of you not familiar with TAP, it's uh, temporary alternative placement. This is our short-term suspension. I remember, I define long-term suspension in anything over 10 days. Anything shorter than 10 days, three to 10 days, they can be in our TAP, our uh, temporary alternative placement. And the design of that was so that we wouldn't be sending kids home uh, to be in empty houses and not be able to keep up with their work. So by sending them to TAP, we'd be able to have them continue on with their academic work. We have a teacher and a parent in that room, and it's now located at the Polk Center, and so we have a lot of uh, additional supports. And so our TAP placements uh, have, again, fluctuated, uh, but uh, back in 2006-07, we were at 481. Um, our la uh, last year, we were at 616. This year, we had 527 TAP placements. Uh, I have to admit, I am concerned about our number of TAP placements. Not that there are too many, that there are too few. If you start looking at uh, 2841 on our suspensions and only 527 TAP placements, I'm saying, I don't want kids. We're sending kids home. We got out of school suspensions. That's where we want to send those kids. We want to have kids uh, connected to academics, even when they're not in an, uh, the regular academic setting. So I'm, I am concerned about that. Uh, the number of expulsions, again, I said that we uh, dropped from 2007 uh, they've been consistent over the last uh, six years, uh, eight, seven, and this year we only had six expulsions. But I caution you, we have been utilizing long-term suspensions a lot more, and so uh, some of the fall off of our expulsions is our long-term suspensions. We started utilizing long-term suspensions in 2008, 2009. We had one. Uh, 2009-10, we had three. 2010-11, we had 37. 2011-12, we had 37, and this year we were well over 51 uh, long-term suspensions. All of those, of course, they come to you, um, and uh, the, the, they have a right as citizens and as, uh, as, school, as uh, members of our, our school district to come and bring those hearings before you. And what our office has done is given them the option of either bringing them to you and having a hearing before you or waiving the hearing and taking the, um, the long-term suspension or, ex or expulsion. Uh, as you know, this year we only had one uh, expulsion, actually one expulsion in the last three years has actually come before the board that you've actually heard uh, in a hearing. The rest of those have been mediated out and we've come to agreement with the parents so that they wouldn't come before you uh, and we would satisfy those uh, requirements. Um, I want to get into some of the disproportionality. Uh, I know some of you have questions. I got a question from one of the board members earlier, so I'm going to uh, hold off because I'm sure that that's going to come up. But I do have some grave concerns, and I will mention some of the numbers right off the bat. Uh, when we start to look at this year alone, and we look at our elementary suspensions, we have 78% of those elementary uh, suspensions are made up by our males, 22 for our females. But when we start to look at the, the, the ethnicity, 29% of elementary um, suspensions are African American, 48% are, are uh, Caucasian, 10% uh, of the uh, suspensions are uh, female, uh, black females, and 12% are white females. If you know the makeup of our district, that's uh, considerable uh, disproportionality. At our middle school, uh, we have 28% uh, for black males, 42% for white males, 13% uh, for black females, 15% for white females. At our high school, it's 24 and 14 uh, for black, female, black males and black females, and 35 and 19 for white females, white males and white females. Uh, at the high school, it's 63% for males and 37% for females. So there's a little more gender balance if that's what we were shooting for. Of course, we're not. We're just taking what comes in the door. Uh, but at the elementary and the middle school, you'll notice that there is some disparities between uh, uh, male and female as far as uh, suspensions. So again, there's some concerns there that we want to come up with and we want to talk about and we want to address. But I know that you have questions, and I'm probably up to my three to five minutes. So I'm going to ask you if you have additional questions. Um, my, my first question is, can I have that data that you Absolutely. just read to us? Yep. OK, because I I'm, thought it was in this attachment. I didn't find it in my attachment. It's in your material, but it's not in this form. Right. What I, the other thing I am asking, I have charted this out. Uh, and I also want to make, make you aware that Myrna Smith did a, 
a yeoman's job, we had some uh, disparities in our numbers and our counts, um, and we have to work, out, work that system out. But she alone spent a lot of time over the weekend trying to find, I showed her, I said, these numbers are off, these numbers are off, and she found all of those numbers and, and made them balance. And so it um, takes a lot of work to, that goes into putting these together, but we have it in a chart form. I'll let you see that chart. I'd like to get feedback from all of the board members on, is this the format that you like? Are there additional uh, materials or data that you'd like to see in that? So if you'll send that to me, uh, uh, I'll send it out to the board. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, and it, you're right, Ann, it is in there, but you have to really dig deep to yeah. pull and that, those. And it's mostly, it looks like it's all this year's information. It doesn't have that history. Yeah, we, we'd like to see that history as well. I have it, history right there. Yeah, it gives us that perspective. Yeah. Um, and then maybe before you send it out, you could even give us the perspective of when SROs, when our, our school resource officers were employed, and if there's been any change since that employment. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, other questions, comments? Gary? Um, this is, uh, I, I guess, you know, there's, I'll, I'll start it this way. There's. There's ways that we can reduce the office referrals. There's ways that we can reduce the, 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 the suspensions. Um, but it's not going to reduce the problems that are there. You know, if kids aren't sent down to the office, that's going to reduce the, the, the number of office suspensions. That doesn't mean that there aren't uh, inappropriate behavior that's happening in the classroom. It's just not going to show up on your on your data. Um, if things aren't reported to administration, there may not be suspensions. There may not be the action. What you've you've talked about the disparity between some of our our groups as far as uh, suspensions and off. Do you have any recommendations on what we could do to uh, be addressing the problem? truly to solving the problem, not just making the, the numbers look different. Absolutely. Uh, I think that one of the areas, and uh, we, we, we piloted a program this year called Check and Connect uh, with our, our learning supports uh, liaisons, and the design of that was to identify students at the at-risk level, um, second level, and third level tier that we could spend time with on a regular basis, document those times, make interventions on a regular basis. Uh, what we're gonna find is it's, it comes down to relationships. Um, we can talk about you know, how we want to address uh, the issues uh, from a policy uh, standpoint, but if we don't start to build closer relationships, and this is what we went on those uh, Chicago trips uh, a few uh, weeks back, and that's what came out of a lot of that. Uh, one is your relationships. You, you have to connect with the kids, and we have not done an extremely good job of connecting with our kids, and part of it has to do with, with our mindset. Um, we don't necessarily see these kids uh, in the light of where they're coming from. Uh, our old uh, colleague used to say that uh, the parents are sending us the best kids that they have. They're not holding any of them back at home. Uh, we're getting the best that they have. We have to address the needs of these kids, and there has to be a shift in how we go about that. It's really nice to be able to spend a lot of time with our kids that we know are college-bound and they're going there, and that's what we're trying to do with our, uh, our uh, transforming school counselors. We need to give attention to those other kids because in order to help those kids come up, uh, we got to connect with them. We have to find out what's going on with them. Behind every one of these numbers is a story. There's something going on with these kids. Uh, fortunately, over the past years, you've given me the opportunity to spend some time with those families and learn what those stories are so that I could help them be able to maneuver and navigate our system. But we can't just deal with those kids that are coming to hearing. We, gotta, we can deal with some of those kids before they came to hearing. We know some of the problems that are going on. Uh, we do have some of the resources to be able to, to meet those needs. And so starts off with a relationship. The other thing is a structure. Uh, we have said, and we've been comfortable with this, that uh, some of this is uh, cultural. And uh, we've made, I've heard comments at our high school that we're not going to fight that battle, like uh, uh, guys walking around with their pants sagging, uh, hats on. Uh, you have kids coming from unstructured homes, and you're going to allow them to have a free-range structure in your school. Uh, that's not going to work. Even Chicago schools figured that out. We went to one school where they said the type of students we have, 
they're motivated, they're compliant. You don't need much structure with the motivated compliant kid. Um, they're not gonna give you many discipline problems. And they said they don't have very many discipline problems. The other school across town that we went to, they aren't motivated, they aren't compliant. And they had a really tight structure. They had a dress code, um, they had a merit system, and they were getting 100% of those kids graduated. We have to decide that we're going to do something different. We can't continue on and say that it's okay for our kids to run around with their pants hanging. And do. If we are a school system, and I think I heard Dr. Benson say this, I'm going to put you on the hook for this, mm -hmm. uh, that we are one of the one entities that has the authority to call meetings or call people together. We are also an entity that has have the kids already coming to us. If we set up the structure, they will abide by it. What else are they going to do? They've abided by the other structure that we set up. And so we have to decide, is the teaching also, in addition to content, is it also behavior? And I'm saying it is. Our original charge was to operate in local parentes. That means we teach behavior as well. We teach with our expectations. We raise those level of expectations so that we can help our kids. And so we have to also change our mindset. We come in to encounter a lot of these issues and problems and we, we wonder and we start scratching our head. And I'm saying the simple solution is to ask yourself this, what would you do with your own child? That answers it. How far would you go for your own child? That answers a lot of the, the confusion. If you'll do it for your own child, do it for these kids because that's what the expectation should be, that we'll go that extra mile, we'll go as far as it takes to make sure that these kids have an opportunity to be successful. And so it's, it, it's not an easy answer. It's going to take time. It's going to take energy. And you got to have to work harder. Those schools that we saw that were getting it done in Chicago, they're working harder. They're putting things into place. And one of the things they kept saying is, we don't have time to, for all of the other stuff. We have to focus on these kids and helping them to get through. And so they were focused, like parents are focused, on trying to help their kids be successful. Long answer to a short question. I, just a reaction to... Uh a couple of things you said. First of all, you're, I, I totally agree. It, it is about relationships. Uh, said it earlier, we, we need to uh, instill and uh, support that we develop those relationships. It'll help all students to learn. Uh, contradict a little bit, though, because I was on that Chicago visit. Uh, yes, they had uh, high expectations, but even those that had 100%, the one school that we visited had 100% graduation. They didn't have 100% of their enrollment finish the four years. They had students that dropped out. 15% in the freshman mm -hmm. year this year, right. and, um, they lost. And, and it was an option school. They had, the, they optioned into mm -hmm. that, um, and they knew what the expectations are going in, uh, which, which is a little bit different, much different, than uh, we opened the doors and, and every student uh, that walks in we serve and I, I, I don't um, that's the way it should be I, I agree with that uh, I think we have to do uh, uh, again it's relationships I think we have to uh, identify students that are that are struggling early on they don't go from one incident typically into a suspension there are things that build up to it uh, when we see those things we, the interventions that uh, we can put in place and again those strong relationships so um, a good discussion I'd that like to add continue. to your comment on that doc, uh, director uh, and Hall is that they lost 15 percent we lose 15 plus I still would buy for the 85 versus losing a big portion of them in, in addition to that I'm not saying that they're 100 percent I don't need them to be 100 percent I'd like to get that 85. If we got up to 85, I'd be, I'd be happy, uh, at least for momentarily until I start digging into that 15. But we're not at 85. If we start getting up into the 85, then we, we have something to celebrate. But we're not at 85 right now. We're losing a tre tremendous amount of students. And I started to think about this and use a basketball term. Our, our assist to turnover ratio is horrible. We have to get better at our assist to turnover. If we had a point guard running that, uh, we wouldn't have them at point guard very long. So I'm just saying as a system, and it's not anybody's particular fault, it's that we have embraced a system that has come to its term. We have to change. If we don't change, then we're going to continue to have the turnover ratio that we have. 
And so we have to just be honest about our system and say, our system isn't the best and it could get better. But if we just keep on with the idea that it's good enough, it, the good is gonna be the enemy of the better. John. So you know I'm passionate about this. Uh, Aaron, um, Nancy and I work together at the University of Iowa in two different offices that deal directly with diversity related issues and uh, there were a lot of issues many, many years ago I think at the university related to diversity and it took a lot of people coming together and building relationships but we also set up really strong expectations and since I've been on the board and I know uh, since Dr. Benson has been here and, and a lot of us we've had a strong focus on equity and, and diversity related issues in our district and there's been a lot of initiatives we spent tens of thousands of dollars on ed trust we've uh, brought together people from the community from diverse backgrounds to talk about the issues. We've done surveys to find out what the issues are. We've uh, been in the buildings and talked to folks. We've worked with community partners about what the issues are. So I don't think there's any, uh, there's any doubt about what the big issues are, and I think you're aware of that. So as volunteer board, school board members, we need to have an action plan, and that action plan needs to come from you and from the administration. Since this is a work session, I'm not just going to ask a question, but I'm going to say what I think here. I think the administration and you in particular, Aaron, in your role, need to come with the diversity committee that we've created and tell us as a board what are the policies that would make a difference to hold administrators and teachers and folks in the buildings accountable uh, for what's happening with our kids. Uh, in this situation that's adding to this disproportionality. And uh, I read in the Gazette today and compliment them on their, their reporting and their editorial. I don't agree with all of it, but I do agree with some of it. There are examples of policies like in Iowa City that give clear cut ways that uh, administrators can ensure that they're being fair with our students. We've presented ideas for having cultural competency discussions with staff with teachers and with students in this district and I haven't seen one movement at all on that and maybe it's happening we just haven't been presented it yet but I think as a board member I think we as a board having this as one of our top priorities of closing this achievement gap related to diversity and this fits right into it it fits into what Dr. Stephen talked to us about from her committee cultural competency of staff um, our, our community is getting more diverse we're getting students from places that are unfamiliar to many of us, that many folks are maybe uncomfortable um, communicating with and uh, working with. There are plans in place that work, and we're, we've paid all this money out. I, as a board member, expect there to be a plan in place with measurable outcomes that will show us either we're meeting this or we're not meeting this. We, as a board, aren't the experts on this. That's why we hire you. We, we hold Dr. Benson accountable as our one employee to this. So as one board member, I'm saying I'm tired of waiting. I've been on this board now over six years, and uh, this has been a priority for a long time. There's been too much talk about it. And uh, my priority as a board member is that this gets taken care of, that there are things that are happening and working other places. Um, I think our community is getting frustrated. People on some of our boards are communicating to me that they're getting frustrated because the talk is talking, but the walk isn't walking yet, and we need to get it moving. And, uh, and I, as a board member, am holding you guys accountable for that. So that's my two cents. I don't know if you have comments about that, but I'm open to them. Or Dr. I got, Benson. I got comments when you gave me the mic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I've heard the cultural competency um, thing for a long time and uh, I don't I'm not saying that cultural competency is isn't the uh, part of the the, the solution uh, I am saying that the actions that we take uh, do need to bring about some accountability uh, one of the things that I was again pleased with that the one school was that they had a way of holding all the teachers accountable for doing the discipline that we that that was put in place uh, I've been around for a little bit. It's not my first rodeo. Boys Town was here once upon a time. We got some great results from Boys Town. It was uh, interesting how we abandoned that process, and I know the, I heard all of the reasons why uh, it took too much time to do a teaching interaction uh, with kid. It was too restrictive, those types of things. My issue has to do with, as a parent, um, I don't really care how much time it takes you. 
Uh, and I have parents say this to me in no uncertain terms. I don't really care how hard it is. Um, I do care that you do the best job you can for, for my kid. I think that's what they're asking. And I'm saying if we have some things put in place, just like your issues with the PBIS, then there needs to be an accountability system to make sure that it works. We can't just stand around and applaud just because we put things in place. And that's what I see us doing. We, we, we're happy that we put things in place. We're not talking about whether they work or not. We're not talking about how effective that they are or not. So we have a process that, that we started piloting. I just mentioned it, the check and connect process. It takes a lot of time. We meet with students. I had 20 students on my caseload this year because I said, if my staff are going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so I went and made sure that I checked on those students two, three times a week, checked with their families, did all of that. Um, is that something that's going to, no, people aren't seeing that, but that's what needs to be done. These families aren't going to go away. Their problems and their issues aren't going to go away. But what about those people who are out there doing that every day? We're not sitting around waiting for something to happen. Uh, we're not sitting around saying, well, hey, we're not going to do anything until the board holds us accountable. This work has taken place, has been taking place for years. Um, just like the stuff that we did with the, with the families that used to stand before you guys uh, as a board and took up a lot of your time. They're not taking up a lot of your time, but they're taking up somebody's time. Our office is handling that, those things. So I'm saying, well, you maybe handled that, You handled them before. They just came to the board. Well, I thought the, the board wanted to hear those. They, they asked, mm -hmm. um, and then the board didn't want to hear them, and that's fine. Um, if, the, if the parents wanted to come, we, we'd bring them. We're not stopping them from coming. My point is that we, there are some things going on. We'd like to get some more support uh, from the board uh, in a way of trying to be able to carry on this work. Well, so, so tell us, you got to tell us what that is. I mean, just by saying that, if I don't know what it is or the board doesn't know what it is, how can it happen? You have to bring to us specific recommendations and uh, a plan with accountability built into it. Okay. What are the measures? I'll throw, I'll throw one out. You asked. Um, we, we say that we have a problem with uh, disproportionality. We do. We have uh, more kids being sent to the office uh, that are minority. We have more kids that are being suspended that are minority. Uh, we have an issue with how we deal with minorities in this district. I'm going to scratch that. Not minorities. African Americans. Because the Asians are doing fine in our district. They're not being sent to the office in a disproportionate manner. They're not being suspended at a disproportionate rate. So, not minorities. It's African Americans. You say that that's important, but we just had a, I'd call it a, you know, pencil dust uh, budget cut. I lost a staff person that was dealing with the minorities. I have the smallest department, the smallest budget, and you cut that staff person. And you guys all signed off on it. Not act, I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm saying if we're focused on African Americans, if that's the population that's not doing well, this is a person who's meeting with these students, that is dealing with the problems from day to day, and they're gone. So I'm saying that there has to be walking the talk. You can't just tell me that you're supporting me, and then every time I turn around, there's no money to do this, there's no staff to do that. Sorry, that, that's just not supportive. And the work continues, and we'll continue to do the work. That person did hearings, that person did one-on-one -on -one meetings, that person did counseling groups, that person did all of those things. We'll carry it on, but... Do you want the work to continue and us to do a better job? Then I think that we need to start supporting those things. And equity cannot be fair. This is what we're saying. Everybody gets the same thing. If Shaquille O'Neal came in the door and said, hey, I'm going to give a whole class uh, gym shoes, they'd be all excited until they found out that he's going to do it fairly. He's going to give them all 22s. They all have to wear 22s to enjoy those shoes. It's not, equity's not fair. Sometimes the ones who have the least need to get a little bit more. I have a question about um, suspensions with a purpose and if we're really measuring the outcome of what happens after suspension. No. Uh, and what I mean is, is, you know, you get a suspension, oh, I'm out of the classroom today. You know, you get a suspension, no, you're not. You're in a more intense classroom. Uh, and... How, how, how well do you perform after that suspension? I mean, we need to start measuring success as well, too, to be sure that what we're doing leads to success. I agree. And, and, and that's why I really appreciate, you know, moving away from expulsion because expulsion has a lot of budget 
budget items for the district, but it also tends to really, really limit a student, you know, three years from now or whatever, uh, versus suspension on the record isn't quite as devastating. So. I agree. Yeah. Yes. Are we doing that though? Are we really taking our suspensions and saying this is going to lead to that? Are we taking our, I'm clarifying Are we really taking the suspensions and planning them and saying, okay, you know, I'm going to give you a suspension. This is the educational alternative you're going to go into and this is the outcome that, that we want after that expansion. Suspension. We're starting me. to do a little bit more of that, especially with the Polk Center. This is for our first year with the Polk Center. Um, but we are starting to do a little bit more of that, trying to plan a little more. We got an opportunity for, well, we got two opportunities. Uh, juvenile Court has extended uh, a, another position for us to be able to address some of the elementary issues that we're having uh, with uh, uh, young students, very young, under 10, getting charged. And so they've offered us a position that we're going to partner on so that we don't have to, because they don't deal with those young students. So we need to figure out a way to deal with those. Uh, the other uh, opportunity we have is that we've been, uh, have, have the opportunity to go to Georgetown in the fall to talk about specifically, and this is the topic that we're, our team is looking at right now, a team of school, community, juvenile court, police, uh, and we even have a juvenile judge on there, to talk about what are the major problems that we have and how can we come up with solutions. The problem that we're picking right now is we got the arrest in schools. How can we lower the number of arrests that are taking place <coughs> in schools? Because that's really becoming the predominant uh, issue. So we're starting to look at that, but again, staff issues have something to do with that. Nancy? I'm looking at uh, one chart here that you have, Aaron, on the uh, office referrals by grade and ethnicity. And I'm looking at African Americans in like kindergarten, 54.17% are referrals. Do, do you know why that is so high? I mean, kindergarten? Kindergarten. No, I don't. And that's a concern uh, because we're at that, that was last year's 20% mm -hmm. of that, uh, <clears throat> of our uh, population was African American in that class. So we need to look at what's that look like this year? In first grade, are the office referrals um, at that extent? Because uh, one of the things that I, I saw, I was at a workshop and he says that, you know, because you get frustrated or you get angry or the kid drives you to your limit, is that really a good reason to suspend or uh, send the kid out of class? Um, and we have to really take a look at how we do that in our system because the office referrals and then it goes to the suspensions and then it comes to um, uh, we've been talking in our office about the number of hearings that we do. Uh, and the bottom line is that we have to come up with more effective strategies uh, to handle those things in the buildings and in the classrooms in order to make sure that we're not sending kids out. And again, I go back to the relationship. That if you got a better, the better your relationship is with that kid, the less likely you're going to have to send that kid out of school or to have the same behavior issues. And that's good. There's some pre-work that needs to take place in order to get that done. And Director Hummels, when I looked at that data and, and uh, Aaron and I visited about it, the percentage data uh, can be uh, misleading in, in the sense that you don't know the number of incidences that are reflected in the per, uh, percents. So I have asked him to provide the uh, an unduplicated count of how many children we're talking about uh -huh. as opposed to a percent of an unknown in. And I have to admit that this is not my chart. This, I, stole that from Carla and when she's back in town she's gonna help me break I couldn't find get to the end the end on these okay, um, let me offer a couple of suggestions you said you wanted some direction I I think one of them is we look if you're talking about relationships and capacity we look at as we hire employees do they have the capacity to work with a diversified What's our screening process? What's our interview process? What are the characteristics we're looking for? Uh, we identify staff that can work with a diverse population that uh, can be effective, and we place them in those, those circumstances. We went to Chicago and we saw some programs. Uh, we saw a variety of programs. Uh, they all had the key things where they had a, uh, a focus. They had an administration, uh, administrator administration that uh, that 
directed and focused the, that building, uh, and clear leadership. Um, what can we do? Um, We've made the visits, we've looked at these things, we've studied, we've read books and so on. I think what John was asking for, can we come back now, can we have, uh, uh, start implementing, trying some things that are out of the box that we haven't done before, that, uh, that uh, we can do. And the other is, uh, when you talk about suspensions, no matter what the gender, what the race is, it's about engagement and motivation. <coughs> If students are engaged and motivated, these things disappear. So I think, again, it's what can we do to engage and motivate students? We saw some of it earlier presentation. Uh, one size doesn't fit all. So maybe we need some different kinds of programming for different kinds of kids. But I, again, I think we're sitting back. Bring us some, ac bring us some clear cut uh, actions, uh, some programs that we can look at, that we can uh, monitor, and, uh, and if they're successful, uh, we will look at the, um, again, uh, putting the resources are there if we have the, the, the motivation to, to put them there. And I wanna, wanna commend you also uh, because of the, the Ed Trust relationship that we had that uh, Dr. Benson brought us into. This transforming school counseling does have the potential to help us to turn around some major things that are going on in our high schools and help put some of our kids on track as we start to set goals and look at how all of those kids are, are matriculating through our system where we haven't before. And so I think that, the, that that has been an investment. We're doing it over three years. It's going to take time, but they are setting goals. They are moving forward. I would encourage you to keep an eye on it. We, I think we're planning on doing a, a presentation uh, uh, to, to the board sometime in the mm -hmm. fall. So that is one of those initiatives that we've been working at that I think is going to pay some dividends. So, Kate, John, did you have a comment? I was just going to say you brought up the expectations, and I think that that's one of the areas, Aaron, maybe, you know, in terms of parental expectations. As a parent myself, when I go to the, the high school the, before the year starts kind of thing for parents, there's a lot of parents that aren't there, and um, guessing from who is there, a lot of the parents are parents of some of these kids that we're talking about. So um, it would be good for us to know, you know, what are we doing to uh, reach out to those parents and help set up expectations. I'm guessing we pay dues to this Urban Education Network in Iowa. From what I understand, we're all facing a lot of these same issues, and um, we can't be the only ones in this boat. So what are they doing to engage the families and uh, and the students as they come in new to this. We're seeing students, as you said, coming from all over the place. They're bouncing in and out of our schools, so they're not even students that are staying with us for a full year a lot of the time. Um, we did put our SROs, the, the, the police, into our high schools, and as I understand it, you know, they do make a difference. Uh, in a lot of cases, they're preventing a lot of things, but again, with the, um, the arrest situation, that's obviously something that we could impact. So. Um, I'm hoping that we do that. So your work isn't easy. None of our work is easy. We didn't volunteer for this because it was a cakewalk. So, uh, you know, I don't want to come across too harsh because we are holding you to high expectations. We do need to make sure as a board that we have the resources for you. And that happens with personnel through Dr. Benson. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, that's a conversation that we continue to have as well. So thank you. Okay. Any other final questions or thoughts? Thank you, Aaron. Thank Appreciate you. the information. Uh, next, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Benson to talk about the um, PEPL resolution, which is our physical plant and equipment levy. Yes, this evening you have a resolution uh, to move the physical plant and equipment levy forward, uh, taking it to a vote during the next election for school board meeting members in September. Uh, I want to just make a couple of comments. While I think it's a uh, really important for us to understand that moving the physical plant and equipment levy uh, forward and having an annual vote on the right mix of taxation and uh, as a public policy of the board and having that flexibility that is called for in this resolution. I don't want anybody to be under the uh, illusion that this is, uh, a vote will solve all of our problems uh, that we have identified 
from the uh, uh, physical nature. Uh, I did have a, a, a rather lengthy conversation with a board member about uh, these related issues, and I, I am concerned that our community understand that this is a critical uh, item for us uh, to help address uh, ongoing maintenance issues. Uh, it will not uh, solve our uh, uh, structural problems of a, of a district that has uh, growing older and older and older in our uh, facilities. Uh, and at some point, uh, this community will have to come to grips with what is uh, the appropriate way to go forward. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, if this board in your next uh, strategic planning session after the next election uh, puts that in front of me as a superintendent, uh, uh, I can... Uh, cause the community to engage in that discussion. But the physical plant and equipment levy resolution is important for this community to pass so that we can accelerate some ongoing maintenance that is desperately needed. Our teaching faculty, our staff, and our students deserve to work in buildings as indicated at the last uh, board meeting that uh, have a uh, adequate roof schedule uh, to keep them uh, uh, sound and not leaking, uh, have adequate heating and air conditioning and ventilation systems uh, because a lot of our buildings were built in an era uh, before that was uh, really in place. Uh, so uh, I would encourage the board to uh, uh, move and second and pass this resolution so we can uh, carry that forward. Okay, any questions for Dr. Benson or comments? If not, Ann, would you mind reading the resolution as a motion? No, I move that the board adopts the resolution ordering the election on the question of continuing to levy and impose a voter-approved physical plant and equipment property tax and income surtax. Is there a second, please? Second. This is a roll call action. Director Rosenthal? Aye. Director Liberty? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. Director Westerkamp? Aye. Director Ling? Aye. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to move on to policy manual review and revisions, and I'll turn this over to Dr. Benson and Laurel Day. Laurel. Thank you. Uh, this evening we're going to bring some regulations, policies, and procedures for the board's consideration on the 400 series, which basically deals with instruction in our policy manual. Um, also a couple of regulations, um, or one regulation on distribution of non-district material, which is in the 1,000 portion of the manual, which deals with community relations. Have questions? I think the uh, uh, one issue uh, we did have a question on the instructional programming uh, from a board member, and I appreciate that question. Uh, the recommendation of the school board association, as I understood it, was to drop a reference to co curricular activities in the instructional program policy. But I want the board to know that when you see that as a policy for improvement, we are going to put that reference back in. Even though it's referenced in other policies, I don't want there to be any uh, miscommunication. Uh, uh, we do consider our co-curricular uh, activities that uh, uh, really amplify our curriculum as important. And uh, in reconsidering that upon that question, uh, we're going to put that in uh, for your final uh, draft for approval of the policy at the next board meeting. I would, I would just also like to state that it was never the intention of the Policy Review Committee to, to do otherwise. Um, we just believed that the co-curricular was covered separately in the policy manual, so it's, it's not a problem to put it back in. Um, we appreciate the feedback. Questions, comments? Just, could you explain to us, maybe the public doesn't understand this, but the electronic backpack for distribution of materials, this is something new that's going on? And Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, perhaps uh, Mary Ellen would like to comment on that. Uh, I think this is a, a, a really positive uh, leap forward as we uh, seek to increase our electronic communication with our public. Yes, in an effort to kind of go green and um, not use as much paper, one of the things that we have decided to do is for di distribution of materials to families. Um, we would be using an electronic version, an electronic backpack. 
Most of our schools currently have a list of families, um, email addresses, ways to access those families um, electronically. And for those families where they do not have access in that manner, we would provide paper copies but for the, or provide flyers at the school um, and so forth. But it's, it's in an effort to kind of uh, go green in a sense and be more uh, responsible um, with the cons consumption of paper. Many districts, probably most districts, have done this previously. So it is something that we've been talking about for a few years now. And um, we think we have a pretty good system uh, to post information. It will go through our community relations department um, and provide the information to families about opportunities for their children or opportunities for um, their families. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next is the 2013-2016 work agreement for the superintendent of schools. I did work with legal counsel and Dr. Benson in, in, uh, in with that document, and you've been presented that. I ask at this time if anyone has any questions or comments. If not, it's recommended that the Board of Education approve the amendments to the 2013-16 work agreement for the superintendent of schools. This is a roll call action. Director Laberty. Aye. Director Humbles. Aye. Director Ann Holt? Aye. Director Westerkamp? Aye. Director Rosenthal? Aye. President Meisterling? Aye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I'll turn this over to Jill Ciravella to talk okay. about the terms and conditions for a number of work groups. Thank you. I did combine um, in, uh, in my report here that two different work groups, those that are bargained work groups and those that are non-bargaining, I've included those all in uh, two separate documents there. Um, and in addition, we have the issuance of administrative contracts and meet and confer letters that would go out. I still have one group left to bring back to you at the next board meeting, but this pretty much concludes most of the bargaining. I did have to uh, um, clarify one thing. I had put in there that the teacher associates had ratified their agreement that is not yet ratified um, but it is scheduled for ratification is expected to ratify so um, with that I just want to thank all of the employees and bargaining representatives that assisted us this year I think we've had a very successful bargaining year many good changes good thank you Jill so it's recommended that the Board of Education approve these terms and conditions of employment for these employee work groups as stated in your board pra board packet for the 2013-14 school year can I have a all those in, this is a roll call action. Sorry. <laughs> Director Ann <laughs> Holt. Aye. Director Westerkamp. Aye. Director Rosenthal. Aye. Director Laverty. Aye. President Meisterling. Aye. Next is the resolution is issuance of administrative contracts. This is a roll call action. It's recommended that the Board of Education approve the following resolution whereas certain personnel are eligible for contracts to perform services as administrators for a period of one year or two years beginning July 1st, 2013. Now, therefore, be it resolved that contracts for the appropriate period be issued to administrators assigned to the positions of assistant to superintendent, board secretary, associate superintendent, executive administrators, directors, executive directors, associate directors, managers, principals, and associate principals. This is a roll call action. Would there be a second to that motion? Second. Sorry about that. Director Ann Halt? Aye. Director Camp? Aye. Director Rosenthal? Aye. Director Laverty? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. President Meisterling? Aye. Next is a resolution to issuance of meet and confer employee assignment letters. And Ann, would you go ahead and read that recommendation as a motion? Yes, I move that we resolve that contracts for the appropriate period be issued to employees assigned to the positions of information technology technicians confidential secretary, school board liaison, specialist supervisors, specialist supervisor, and technician. Second. Thank you. This is a roll call action. Director Westerkamp? Aye. Director Rosenthal? Aye. Director Laverty? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. President Meisterling? It's recommended the Board of Education approve the terms and conditions of employment for bargained work groups for the 2013-14 school year. As presented in our agenda, this is also a roll call action. Director Rosenthal? Aye. Director Laverty? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. Director Westerkamp? Aye. And President Meisterling? Aye. Okay, I got them all, right? You did. Okay, very good. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tonight is Dr. O'Malley's last night 
We appreciate your work in the district. Um, we've, we've got a lot of things accomplished over the last four years, and you're certainly a, a significant part of those accomplishments. We wish you nothing but the best as you now transfer or uh, transist into a, a new position in Mount Vernon, and I'm sure you're welcome to have you. And uh, well, it's just a great move for you, Gary. So. You're very welcome. It's also Dr. Sandy Stephen last night in our district is at a board meeting and she would like she's got some prepared comments that she would like to share with the board. Thank you President Meisterling for this opportunity to address the board. <clears throat> I've had the privilege of working in the Cedar Rapids Community School District for over four decades. And during that time, I've worked with seven superintendents, and numerous boards of education, thousands of staff members and students. We've responded to reports like a nation at risk. We have been compliant with changes in state and federal legislation, including the No Child Left Behind Act. And in that effort, I have assembled and shared nearly 20 annual progress reports and compiled approximately the same number of comprehensive school improvement plans for the district. <laughs> Through it all, I have witnessed the unwavering dedication of thousands of educators to improve education and the quality of lives of the children and families in our community. <clears throat> our community has changed. Our school district has changed. The 2008 flood devastated our community, our neighborhoods, and some of our facilities. But it did not damage our resolve to rebuild and recover. Over the years, we have seen poverty increase and enrollment decline, and still the performance of our students exceeds national norms. We have used multiple measures to monitor student achievement and a variety of data to examine the effectiveness of programs and services. In response to this information, we have implemented new technologies and innovative software, developed new programs, expanded course offerings, and implemented the Iowa Core Standards. Our teacher leadership initiatives have been recognized through career ladder grants and the opportunities that we have provided teachers to serve as facilitators, coaches, mentors, and PLC leaders have been recognized and showcased by the Iowa Department of Education. Our creative use of early release time for job alikes to meet as professional learning communities to improve teaching and learning is envied by many districts. We have been and continue to be recognized as a lighthouse district at both state and national levels. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board and all prior boards for their sustained efforts to set policy and provide resources to ensure high quality educational programs and services for every student in the district. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to have worked with you over the years, and I have found my career in education to be interesting, challenging, and rewarding. I am hopeful and expect that the traditions of excellence we have established in this district will continue. I look forward to my efforts to assist in solving the complex problems of education. Thank you. Sandy, thank you so very much. You'll be greatly missed in our district. Um, I've been on the board 11 years. I know Ann and Keith have been on a little bit longer than I have, and you've been a consistent voice in, in delivering uh, good messages on student achievement and all the things that you talked about in your comments tonight. And, and finishing your year with such a great um, board of, or a direct, uh, Department of Education report mm -hmm. has just been fantastic. Thank you. And we salute you for all the things that you've done. Um, I just wanted to make one correction. You said that you'd had worked with numerous boards, but I think you wanted to say this is the best board that well, you've done. I, did. <laughs> I thought that was implied, but yes, that's true. <laughs> and I'd like at this time, everyone take your calendars home, but I'd like the board to go ahead and stand in front of the dais and please join us, executive staff, and let's send Gary and Sandy off to a, a fine farewell.
Thanks for your work.